I hear many challenges around open science, fair data, data life cycles, etc. But what exactly do we mean by that? Our following keynote speaker will explain us. Please welcome postdoctoral researcher at the University of Groningen, Vera Heininga. Vera, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank Hello, you for me. where are you calling from? I'm calling from Groningen. From Groningen, great. Yeah. Up north. Up north, yes, the upper northern, most northern city of the Netherlands. Uh, Great. Now, I believe your keynote has made us come closer to understanding the underlying topics. Thanks again, and uh, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, if I can, yes, ah, my slides. Yeah, thanks so much for this introduction, because indeed, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Groningen, but I'm also the Open Science Coordinator, and I am the chair of the Open Science Community Groningen, um, which um, I, together with uh, some colleagues at the University of Groningen, uh, founded in 2019, two years ago already. Um, and today I was asked to tell a little bit more um, about, um, well, open science, but also how open science communities can help in this transi transition towards uh, open science. Um, I would like to start with what was already discussed as well in the opening. Um, what is open science? What is the definition of open science? But also maybe, what is it not? Um, I think that's also a very important part and often left out. Um, the second thing that I would like to address is the national and international developments that has recently or less recently um, been going on, which are relevant to open science and the open science movement. Um, thereafter, I will um, tell you a little bit more about the advantages and the challenges um, in applying open science practices from a researcher's uh, perspective. And I will end with how open science communities, such as the Open Science Community Groningen, uh, can help in the transition uh, towards open science. So what is open science? Well, it was already, I think, nicely um, uh, described in the opening, but open science is indeed a movement which, which, which aims to make scientific research, data, dissemination uh, accessible to all levels of an inquiry in society. This is how we describe the movement, open science as a movement, or how it's defined by uh, FOSTER. Uh, FOSTER is a EU um, uh, learning platform, a European learning platform online, uh, which I think has um, a lot of well, it's a great source for a lot of open science materials um, and also this definition um, because it's important if we talk about open science that we know what we're talking about because uh, especially the, the last couple of years, um, open science is a topic of debate even more and more. Um, but if we talk about open science, it's not always clear what we talk about. Um, open science is a really an, an well, umbrella term for a lot of things. Um, and if we go back to Foster, they define that the practices of open science as doing science in such a way that others can collaborate and contribute, um, where the research data, the lab notes, and other research materials are freely available uh, under the terms that enable reuse, redistribution, and uh, reproduction of the research and its underlying data and methods. So I, hi I highlighted here the most important keywords um, um, or open science, which um, also mentioned in the opening is collaboration um, and also that you can contribute in an earlier phase than that you do now, for example, in a preprint instead of um, some print. Um, and of course, the essence of open science is that it's freely available, that it's accessible to all. Um, and you, still, you can specify your own terms that enable reuse, distribution and reproduction. So really, um, well, making it able to, to check also uh, and, and reproduce your findings. Um, so open science is really an, an, an umbrella term, but that's also because it spans the entire research cycle um, that comes from planning, data collection, analysis, publication to outreach and evaluation. Um, here you can see the beautiful rainbow of open science practices um, published by uh, 
uh, Bianca Kramer and Jeroen Bosman in 2018. Um, and what you can see here is the entire research cycle, starting at the, at the well, it, at the search. So basically the planning where you can share your research proposals, for example, and they give examples for every step of the way up until the assessment. So really the evaluation of, of researchers. Um, the two open science practices that are most known are open access and uh, open data. And this also brings me towards what is open science not? What is it not? Because most of the time when I talk about open science, I notice that many people think that open science um, is, is exactly the same as open access. Um, and although open access is the most known, as you saw in this um, beautiful rainbow of open science practices, it's not the same. Open science practices really span a lot of more um, things than only these, these publication um, things. Another, um, well, I think misunderstanding uh, worthwhile highlighting here is that open data is also not the same as fair data. It was already mentioned in the opening. Fair data is uh, data that is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's also open. And the other way around, it's the same thing. Open data is not necessarily fair data. Um, so the biggest difference between these two is in the A, in the accessibility. Um, because yeah, if you, um, because in, in fair data, in the context of fair, uh, accessibility means that you have to define who has access to your data um, and under what conditions. But open data really means that you open up to all so that the accessibility is well, publicly available, basically. Um, another thing that open science is not is uh, a goal in itself. So open science is a means to an end, which basically also entails that researchers who are open are not necessarily better researchers uh, than those who are more closed. Um, and this relates also to the last point that open science is not dichotomous in a sense that it's not that a researcher is open or closed, um, but all researchers fall into the continuum of openness. And as it is now, many researchers are already quite open in what they do. I mean, the poll is positive uh, in the sense that data sharing is done uh, well, on a great scale. But I think the question that we have to uh, ask in terms of open science is, are we open enough? Then if we zoom out to, um, well, a bit of the context where, where open science is, is, uh, is unfolding in. Um, we have some international uh, relevant developments. Um, the first one being, um, well, some of the more early developments. Of course, there are way earlier developments than these. But just to give you some examples, in 2011, uh, Prim and colleagues, uh, well, published the, the groundwork for Altmetrics, the alternative way uh, to assess researchers' impact. Um, in 2013, uh, in the United States, they uh, set up the Center for Open Science, COS, which is a nonprofit technology organization with a mission to increase openness, uh, integrity, and re reproducibility of scientific research. And the nice thing is that this organization um, is also uh, the founder of Open Science Framework, also known as OSF. Uh, OSF is this great repository where you can not only pre-register your confirmatory hypotheses a priori, but where you can also upload your data, your scripts, um, all the materials that you need or that you used uh, during your research. Another relevant international development is uh, the, well, recently launched Horizon Europe 2021 call. Um, which now states that the key themes for the upcoming years are global challenges and industrial competitiveness, well, similar to, to previous years, open innovation. Um, but what is new is that they also have this component of open science. And as a matter of fact, they state that open science in the upcoming years will be the modus operandi, so it will be the new normal. Um, they say that beneficiaries, so those who receive money, from this grant must ensure open access uh, publications. They must be in line with the FAIR principles, these findings, 
but they also have to uh, provide access to the data or any other results needed for validation of their um, scientific publications. Which is, I think, um, well, a major change relative to the previous years. Um, another international development is Plan S or Coalition S, uh, which was a coalition that was signed by, I think, 27 uh, um, umbrella organizations in Europe in 2018 um, and states that state funded research must be open access. Um, and as it is now, this is also supported by the European Commission and the World Health uh, Organization. Um, another interesting uh, development is that um, there was published recently a note by the League of European Research Universities, LERU, where many of our universities are also uh, part of. Um, and they again state that they also see open science as part of the new normal in the upcoming years. Um, and this is similar to the other uh, organization, GILT, of the European Research Intensive Universities, um, which have recently um, stated that they started an open science uh, working group. Um, then when we go to the national developments, I think one of the most relevant recent developments is the Strategy Evaluation Protocol, the SEP. Um, this has recently been published and is the way in which institutes within universities in the Netherlands um, are uh, evaluated. And the assessment criteria are research quality, societal relevance and viability of these research institutes. But um, for the upcoming years, starting this year, open science has to, open science has to be addressed in concert to these three uh, assessment criteria, which I think is, is great. But also entails that universities now have to well, move on and, and, and get open science really integrated into the departments or at least the institutes. Um, another recent uh, or relevant development on national level, um, and may, maybe not recent, is that the NWO, um, they already in 2019, well, said that they would, are committed to take the lead in this transition um, and that they strive to ensure all publications are openly available. So really the open access part when they started. Um, in 2016, they introduced the research data management policy, um, and which they stated that research, they aim to make research as open and as fair as possible. Um, and recently they published a statement saying that they are committed to more, modernize the way academics are recognized and rewarded, which of course is also an important aspect of open science. Um, in a similar vein, CERF also aims to make the entire research process more accessible. But of course, CERF focuses more on the open science policies, the, mostly the infrastructure, I think, and the tools. Um, and last but not least, an interesting development is uh, the EMPOS, the National Program of Open Science. They, um, they started in 2016. Actually, they started as a national plan of open science, but recently last year they changed into a national program of open science and they have three pillars. The first one being open access, uh, fair data and citizen science. Um, then from these developments, if we go back to the researcher, um, I would, yeah, if we, if we think about the advantages and challenges that researchers face, here are some of the prominent uh, examples. Um, the advantages for researchers, of course, first and foremost, is that you enable your colleagues to check and verify uh, your outcomes, which, if you ask me, is central key or to science, or, or at least it should be uh, central to science. Um, another advantage of, of applying open science practices in, in the work of the researcher is that it increases the impact. So, Hopefully, um, if you all, all uploaded your data sets uh, into DANS, at least 60% according to the poll, um, we can make it uh, citable. So I hope that will increase in the upcoming uh, years. Another advantage is uh, that it improves the quality of scientific research, um, although possibly at the cost of quantity, of course. Now we have a very strong focus still on the number of publications that researchers have. But I hope that over the years it will um, well transition into more into uh, um, yeah being more transparent about about your research, also as a part of quality um, criteria. 
Um, and the last is without this transparency that some basic scientific norms um, as researchers are just hard to follow. So, for example, we have a recently a new conduct for uh, research integrity as researchers within the Netherlands. And the five guiding principles are honesty, scrupulousness, which translates to uh, uh, transparency, independency and responsibility. But as you can see, transparency is just one of the five uh, guiding principles. Um, here you can see an overview uh, which I found um, on a nature website, which I think depicts very nicely the benefits that, that um, open science can have. And they even categorize it in, in benefits for uh, individual researchers, benefits for communities, and benefits for society. Um, this was actually uh, made with a focus on data sharing, but I think most of the benefits that are mentioned here um, are also applicable uh, to, uh, well, the other parts of open science. Um, so um, if we then go to the challenges that researchers face uh, with regard to open science, um, I think one of the first is that you are forced to be to triple check everything. If you want to be open, you have to annotate your code, you have to triple check that you didn't make any mistakes, that it really is reproducible, your script. Um, and that also makes you a little bit more um, vulnerable, maybe, to criticism that you have to open up um, and that people can read your code. And um, I hear this a lot within the community and, and I have experienced it myself as a researcher that Indeed, the first time that I uploaded my code into OSF, the Open Science Framework, I was also so worried that people would see that, well, my code wasn't perfect or that I'm not a perfect programmer. Um, but um, yeah, I think it's it's just in the beginning, this feels very, 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 yeah, it has a component of anxiety goes with it. But I think it, you have to get used to it. And um, open science is not meant to scrutinize others or to be uh, critiquing others on their style of programming. It's just that uh, you make it, well, more reproducible. I think that's the end goal. Um, but for, yeah, for individual uh, researchers, it may feel differently. Um, another thing that I hear a lot of within the, the community is that especially young researchers, so PhDs, um, have trouble with their superiors don't under, who don't understand why they want to do um, open science practices. For, for example, pre-registrating pre their uh, hypothesis. Um, and that makes it really difficult because sometimes you have to allocate a little bit more time. I'm not sure whether open science would necessarily mean that you have to spend more time on doing science. It's just uh, you do it differently. So it's more at the beginning that you uh, think about your uh, hypotheses. You have to pre-registrate them. Um, uh, but it saves you time in the analysis part. So whereas you would previously, where I, when I speak for myself, um, and it's an anecdotal, uh, anecdotal, of course, but where I would spend three months of, of analyzing and doing my anal analysis, I now do the three months of thinking up front, pre-registrating my um, uh, hypotheses and the exact analysis that I want to do. Of course, in the end, you might deviate from them, but at least you, you um, well, I do my analysis now in a very short amount of time and then um, describe how I deviate from my initial plans. Um, then another challenge is that uh, the incentive structures are currently not supportive of open science. This is a very, very important one. Um, as I uh, said before, there is a strong focus on the number of publications and not necessarily on how open or how transparent um, you are. Um, and this also relates to, to the next point, uh, the closed culture, uh, research culture. So it's, it's Again, very, very hard to change habits. Changing old habits is basically very difficult. And that also um, is the case for uh, open science. Um, maybe uh, worthwhile highlighting here is uh, with regard to open data, um, I also hear a lot of misunderstanding. So what I hear is researchers having the, are under the impression that the data is theirs. So if they want to open up in their data, they don't want to open up because they have the feeling the data is mine, um, which of course was also mentioned in the opening. It's it's tax funded, so it's it's um, it's not really technically theirs, but 
the feeling is there. And I understand that because uh, researchers have spent blood, sweat, sweat and tears in, in collecting their data. Um, and then, yeah, when you ask them to open up, they're, they're a little bit hesitant. Um, it's also because often they think that opening, opening up means that you open up all the data that you collected with blood, sweat and tears, which is not necessarily the case. I mean, for purpose of validation, you only have to publish uh, the, the variables that you use to um, um, test your hypotheses with so that it's reproducible or, or replicable. And the latest one is that uh, many researchers seem to think that the GDPR, the new uh, privacy law, prohibits sharing, which is definitely not true. Um, and I think the, the talk on the fear, fear, fearless uh, data sharing will definitely cover this as well. Um, because you can, well, if you do it in your consent, uh, the GDPR has, as, as, has added, uh, the aim of the GDPR is to protect the privacy of participants. Um, and so if you write in your consent form, for example, that you want to share your data publicly, then there's no problem in, in sharing publicly. And even though if you didn't write it down in your consent form, um, most of the times there are still possibilities to, to share uh, your data. And so um, how can public science communities help in, um, well, maybe also to tackle these challenges that, that researchers feel? Um, Open Science uh, Communities is a platform where people can acquire new skills, uh, share their expertise and articulate the support they need to adapt uh, open science uh, practices. Um, within communities, researchers connect with each other, so it's really a peer group and a bottom-up initiative, um, as well as with uh, support services. Um, so, uh, in the Netherlands, we have 11 open science communities, as you can see here. Um, and uh, recently we expanded, so from a national uh, initiative to a international initiative. And this started uh, in Utrecht uh, by Luke Brinkman and Anita Eerland, who started the first uh, open science community Utrecht. And what they did is they published a manual. So they just published, we just set up an open science community and uh, they described their experiences and they gave some tips on if others would like to set up such a community. And as you can see here in the last three, four years, uh, 11 communities have popped up everywhere in the Netherlands and now recently also in Sweden and in uh, Galway in Ireland. So um, what do these communities do and how can they help? Well, how they can help, in my view, is really to establish this culture change. Um, this culture change has to be a combination of a bottom-up and a top-down a top and bottom-up approach. Um, and the Center of Open Science uh, also has published a, a very interesting blog about this by uh, Brian Nozak on uh, what could be a strategy to really establish this culture and behavioral change with regard to open science. And they came up with this beautiful pyramid, um, which uh, shows you five levels, five different levels on which uh, change has to occur before the culture change um, is really established. The first one being the infrastructure. So it should be made possible for, for researchers to be open. Uh, the second one is user interface and experience. And I would like to add here um, workshops, um, um, yeah, yeah the, the services also, uh, which makes it easy for researchers to, to apply uh, open science practices. Um, then communities, which make it normative. Um, incentives and policies are the other uh, layers or levels, which are very important, I think, but they do those make it required and rewarded. I think that's definitely needed um, if you really want to integrate open science into the daily practice of researchers. So the open science communities, according to Brian Nozak and the uh, Center for Open Science, um, make it, well, mostly normative, but I think that the communities can help even more. I mean, they can also help in making it more rewarding and they can also help to make it make it more easy. Because what do they do? Uh, open science communities, um, they, well, first, first and foremost, organize workshops um, and, and interesting events on, well, the actual, yeah, 
the, the, the recent developments within open science. Um, for example, at the, at the Open Science Community Groningen, we uh, organize a bi-monthly pre-registration uh, session. Um, and in, that, in addition to that, um, and, and a, lot, a lot of other uh, workshops, of course, um, and it differs per uh, open science community. So each community has its own way of, of um, organizing things and the topics that they address. Um, in our latest paper, um, we, we also, what we did is actually we bundled all the things that we as open science communities did. We explained what, what, what could be an example if you want to set up an open science community. We give examples what we have done, how they worked, how you can approach things, um, how you can, well, organize things together with uh, the existing services within the university and so on. So what we do primarily is we promote ser support services from the existing services. So, for example, the university library, but also the digital competence uh, center that many Dutch universities uh, will have in the upcoming years. Um, and we do that via Twitter. So now we have 600 or even more uh, followers uh, in Groningen. And we have a bi-monthly uh, newsletter with 250 subscribers within a year. So I think that's that's great. Um, and what we also do is we support member initiatives. And I think this is unique to an open science community because it's such a bottom-up approach. Um, members that join this community can also then uh, instigate a member initiative. And one of the success examples is the reproducibility, at least within the, uh, within the OSCG, um, which, it, which is um, a very more modern uh, journal club um, in terms of uh, they drink it's, it's a pun, so it's reproducibility tea. They drink tea while discussing uh, certain papers or certain developments, um, all with respect to open science, of course. Uh, another initiative is the science initiative, open science, uh, which really entails the, the um, oh. <laughs> no, no, really no worries, uh, finish it off. You've got time. Okay. A little yeah, bit I don't. Th I don't see my slides anymore, but um, in a nutshell, I think, um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> in a nutshell, I think open science will become the modus operandi for the upcoming several years. Um, and this is a culture change that really requires top down and bottom up collaborative efforts. Um, and open science communities are there to help. They can make it more easy, uh, more narrative and more rewarding. Um, and if you have any questions with regard to open science communities, please get in touch. Um, I might refer you to uh, Anita Eerland and um, Luc Brinkman in Utrecht, um, but I will also uh, try to answer your questions myself. That's it. Thank, Thank you, so you Vera, very, very much for your valuable insights about open science communities in the Netherlands. Um, I have a question for you from Jeff. The idea of making even the proposal phase open is interesting. I wonder how that might influence the current overabundance of submitted proposals. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I don't have a ball where it, I can see in the future, but I know that it's it's um, it's being done right now. I mean, it's by a handful of, of researchers. But for example, um, I have this research proposal with uh, Brian Nozick for a very large uh, American grant, um, and they just published their um, initial. Um, yeah, research proposal online on OSF. Um, and I think we will submit it again, but then just do a new version on the OSF uh, platform. But I'm not Thank sure you. how this will how this will affect uh, things in, in the future, no, of course. Exactly. Well, I hope this was helpful for Jeff. I have another one from Henk. What is the relation or should the relation be between digital competence centers and OSCs? Yeah. Uh, great question. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether I have a prepared answer, but I, I do think there has to be a close collaboration. I mean, uh, open data is such an important aspect and also fair data. So I definitely think see a collaboration between the two um, being that we as a bottom up approach can be a helpful source in a sense that DCCs have to prepare for questions from researchers and the open science community might have well, uh, knowledge on how to answer these questions with regard to well, open data uh, and open science. Thank you. Another one from Christine. What kind of infrastructural services would inspire researchers to already share 
parts of their data with others during the research phase? Oh, that's a difficult one. What infrastructural services? Exactly. Um, I'm not sure what what um, what kind of tools. So during so can I see the question again? So it's, sure. Uh, about the can we see the question again, the research, please? So not necessarily. What kind of infrastructural services would inspire researchers to already share parts of their data with others during the early research phase? Yeah, I'm not sure what infrastructural services. Um, that I, 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 I just think there are so many. Um, right. How they could inspire. I think even if they are there, that is already inspiring in the sense that, that then they, you can use them as tools. Uh, and I think it differs per discipline whether you want to do that during your um, research uh, process in a sense um, yeah so sorry I, I'm not sure um, I, I do not immediately think of a certain service no no worries and it really higher. gives me a good feeling that you don't know everything because you know a lot <laughs> and um, it's been very <laughs> very valuable yeah exactly so uh, uh, I think we have to round off now uh, I see more questions, but maybe they can put them through to you, Vera, and you can answer them in your own time. Thanks again about sharing how uh, important it is that these open science communities keep evolving. So thanks again for your presentation and uh, good luck with your research. Bye-bye for now. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you, Vera. Bye-bye. Yes, more questions were coming in, so fantastic, but we have no time. Um, hopefully you can put them through to Vera and you'll get uh, an answer as soon as possible from her.